three locations, three different stories about the environment. One message. This year is blowing our minds. Storms generated by a powerful weather system. These urchins are in trouble right now. Why is that? Our oceans getting warmer and more toxic. Land frozen for years, now melting. What is happening around the planet and what can science do about it? The latest technology from above and boots on the ground. OK, you have to kind of get down there with your hands in the mud. We're looking for a dead one. All trying to fight back. But is it too late? When the Pacific speaks, everybody around the planet better listen. This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, but we're doing it in a unique <laughs> way. This is a show about science. Oh. oh my God. By scientists. Techno investigates climate chaos. Think the weather's been pretty wacky lately? Well, just wait, it might get even worse. Hey guys, I'm Phil Torres, joined by Dr. Crystal Dilworth and Marita Davison, and today we're talking El Nino. And this is something that we have seen here on the west coast of the US, but it definitely extends far beyond that. And Marita, you've actually experienced it. I experienced a few El Nino events when I was growing up in Bolivia, so it certainly has global impacts. But what it is, is an interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere that happens in the tropical Pacific Ocean. I think for some, that interaction seems like this mysterious force, but this is techno, so of course we want to know what an El Nino is, some of the weird things it's doing, and how researchers are studying it. Severe fires and drought leading to food shortages in 11 South Pacific countries. Mega flooding in Central America forcing thousands to evacuate their homes. And sea life found hundreds of miles from their natural habitats. All this due to a powerful weather system known as El Nino. This year's El Nino is already breaking records for the wettest start in the Pacific Northwest, flooding homes and causing treacherous landslides. They come in all sizes, El Nino, small, medium, large, and then every once in a while you get what I call the Godzilla El Nino. That's right, they're calling the current El Nino Godzilla El Nino. This El Nino, like all El Ninos, is a weather system that begins in the Pacific Ocean at the equator. The Pacific covers 30% of the planet. So I always say, when the Pacific speaks, everybody around the planet better listen. Understanding El Nino begins with the acronym ENSO, or El Nino Southern Oscillation. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, every three to seven years, surface waters of the tropical Pacific Ocean warm or cool by one degree Celsius to three degrees Celsius compared to normal. When this happens, all the pieces on the weatherboard around the planet are changed. What was wet becomes drought and vice versa. You have the maps up here, we're looking at 97, and we're looking at now. What do you see? On the left is 1997. Very, very big event. And we see the same event almost exactly replicated here in 2015. In the years since the last El Nino, NASA went all out, launching a series of satellites for monitoring the world's oceans and predicting weather. So you guys are monitoring it as it happens, using what tools? The satellite has an instrument, it's very cool, it's called an altimeter. It bounces signals off the sea surface, measures the travel time, which really tell you how much heat is stored in the ocean. And of course, that is the key to understanding climate. It's those fluctuations in ocean temperatures that shape the Earth's weather. While some scientists are studying El Nino from space, others are studying it in the oceans. And that's what brought us here to UC Santa Barbara, where scientists are studying El Nino's effect on the Pacific. 
This here is blowing our minds. So when these cold oceans get warm... Dr. Jennifer Castle is a marine biologist analyzing El Nino's impact on sea life. You don't necessarily study the climate. You study the, the creatures in the ocean. What are they telling you about El Nino? The things that we're seeing up here right now in my area, we do not see except on El Ninos, and some of the things we don't even see during normal El Ninos, only this big one. In November 2015, California state officials closed the $60 million commercial crab industry because domoic acid, a neurotoxin, was found in marine life. When we eat the infected crabs, you can get all kinds of serious neurological issues, uh, really bad stuff, leading to death. We have a big mix of species in here. In the UC Santa Barbara Marine Lab, Dr. Castle gave me a closer look at more of the sea life in distress. So if we start with oh, the yeah. urchins, that's amazing. These urchins are in trouble right now. Why is that? Well, the urchins are actually being affected pretty negatively by the warm water. We've just noticed that we might be on the start of an urchin disease epidemic or die-off. The urchins in our area, they're also fished. So urchins are not only important for the oceans, but they're an important industry. They're a very important industry in Southern California. This is so strange. <laughs> It's adorable. Yeah, that's a sea cucumber, actually. And right now it's being affected by what, the algae? The same sort of disease may be affecting these guys. But if there's a silver lining at all to El Nino, it's this. Yeah! Enjoying the effects of the warming Pacific Ocean is the sport fishing industry. El Nino is good for fishermen, yes. It's good fishing. We caught an opa this year in 23 years of being on the water. I, I've never seen an opa. A 120 pound opa, a fish usually found in the tropics, not off the coast of Southern California. Steve Earwood is the skipper of the Coraloma, a hook sport fishing boat out of Channel Island Harbor in Oxnard, California. Normal water temperature this time of year is probably anywhere from 58 to 62 degrees. And right now it's 67 to 72 degrees. The warm water brings all kinds of sea life much further north than usual. From here, they're, they're catching yellowtail, and that's just unheard of. This 23-pound yellowtail, normally found 100 miles south of here, didn't disappoint. That's my first one. <laughs> As we've seen, El Nino impacts the Pacific in many ways. But what about all the promise of rain it brings? Much of the West has been in a drought for years. Is El Nino the great wet hope to solve the water emergency? Bill Patzert at JPL is not optimistic. We've seen drought building slowly for the last decade and a half. One El Nino. One wet winter will not be a drought buster. Not far from JPL is the Morris Dam, an important part of the Los Angeles County water system. There, engineers are hoping El Nino brings heavy rains they can capture. Techno's Crystal Dilworth picks up our story from there. Scientists have been researching the impact of El Nino from space to the sea, but we have an inside look at how infrastructure is being prepared for the storms. We have invested a lot of time and money in doing projects over the last 10 years to make sure that these dams and this infrastructure that was built in the 20s and 30s really are employing now the latest and greatest technologies. Sterling Klippel is a civil engineer with the Los Angeles Department of Public Works. When you look out here, you can see this kind of ring that goes around the reservoir. I'm expecting we're going to see reservoir levels all the way up to the top of that ring. Tell me a little bit about capturing the storm water. How do you do that? We do release water downstream into our spreading basins. And these spreading basins are in areas that um, are kind of gravelly, sandy, it has good uh, geology for the water to move down and into the aquifers. And while the Morris Dam is ready to do its job capturing El Nino water, JPL's Bill Patzert says it's just a drop in the bucket of the larger statewide problem. So here in Southern California, 80 to 90 percent of all that El Nino water that falls will end up in the Pacific Ocean. And it's nice to think that we can capture all this water and put it in our groundwater basins. 
but unfortunately half our groundwater basins are polluted. So when I told you earlier that this El Nino was not a drought buster, those are a couple of the reasons why. So, you know, it's really important not to confuse El Nino with climate change. You know, El Nino is a naturally occurring cyclical phenomenon, as we saw. Climate change is an unprecedented trend that we've been seeing that is driven by human activities, primarily emissions of greenhouse gases. So when you combine those two, you get this naturally occurring thing like El Nino, but it's happening at potentially an unnatural pace or unnatural impact. Well, yes, of course, as the climate begins to warm, you see an increase in precipitation, which is rain, and um, an increased occurrence in things like El Ninos. And what's interesting is that, you know, we know that this trend of climate change is definitely happening. There is no question about it, scientific consensus there, right? But how that's going to interact with this naturally occurring uh, event of El Nino is still pretty uncertain. It was interesting talking to the different researchers. Each one of them had a different take on how El Nino and climate change will impact each other. And, and in general, they said climate change will probably make El Ninos much worse. Continuing on the topic of climate change, now, Phil, I know anytime you have a chance to go to the rainforest, no one has to ask you twice. That's right. I strap on my boots, grab my gear, and uh, I'm there. Now, this forest that we went to in Panama is a rather interesting tropical forest. It's not, not the prettiest of places I've been to. It is wild. It is mangled. It is the mangrove. They are not the prettiest of places, but they are wild, and they are really pretty incredible. And I think because they're not so pretty, they get really underappreciated because they do some pretty amazing things. And you know, more than that, they're one of the most endangered ecosystems worldwide. They uh, are found on virtually every coastline on the planet, and they provide a lot of really critical ecosystem services. They're just amazing. I mean, they stand up to tsunamis, and their root systems can sponge carbon dioxide from the environment, which is so important. Well, I got to go down to Panama and spend some quality time in some mangrove forests, and you could say we got a little too close for comfort at one point. Take a look. They look like something out of a medieval horror story. A mass of gnarled roots, limbs, and vines twisting along seemingly chaotic roots. They may not be the most glamorous trees on the planet, but mangroves might just be one of the most important. Technos come to one of Panama's most important laboratories, Galeta Point Marine Lab, a really cool place at the edge of the Caribbean and on the front lines of climate change. Right. And that's what brings Professor Wayne Souza here. So is this it? This is it, this is the spot. I'll show you some of the species as we go. Professor Souza has been studying mangroves here for more than a decade. He usually brings students down to take data. This year, he's got Jackie, Mackenzie, Josh, and Henry. They're kind of Galetta Point's version of the A-Team. And for our protection, these guys. They bring a bit of reality to our expedition. They're armed and ready. So what they're saying is basically, these biologists working in the forest need a little bit of protection. There's people going in here who are poaching some of the animals, they're fishing, and there's even drug traffic that can go by the coast. So these guys are here to make sure science is safe. Okay, let's head out this way. Watch your step. As we make our way carefully into the mangroves, Professor Souza gives us a warning. How deep is this water here? Well, the water's not very deep, maybe 10, 20 centimeters, okay. but the mud, uh, soft mud, can go down for 10, 10 feet or more. So very thanks deep. to these roots, I'm not in mud right now. Right, yeah, you are sitting. I will stay on the roots. So avoid open water. You got it. Okay. <laughs> the ground is muddy, really muddy. One wrong step is all it takes. Well, oh, oh. oh. Hang on, hang on. You get a good idea of how thick this muck is. We had to pull one of our crew members out. He was waist deep in mangrove mud. The soil here is a mix. Water, sand, 
mud, it's what makes mangroves so special. Mangroves are the uh, wetland of the tropics. So uh, they used to dominate about 75% of tropical coastlines. Um, they've been severely damaged and uh, removed by coastal development. Mangroves provide the transition from ocean to land. Our goal is to make it to the water's edge. Plenty of time for Dr. Souza and his team to get out and do some science. So these are, you know, we have all the big trees tagged, uh, and then we need to find out what's going on with the youngest stages. So this here is what we would call a baby mangrove. It actually falls out of the tree looking like this. And when it hits the ground, it grows these little roots. It'll then turn into a little seedling. This might be a couple years old, and eventually a big tree. Okay, you have to kind of get down there with your hands in the mud. Oh, we're looking for dead ones? Oh yeah, dead ones. When you talk about carbon storage in the roots, are you just talking about these things that we could see here? Uh, no, it's actually several compartments, they might be called. So we have the above ground carbon, the trees themselves. We have these uh, prop roots that are supporting the red mangroves. But then under the soil, at the soil level and below, there's a dense network of roots. And those roots, as they die, become peat. And so you have layers that may be 10 feet deep of peat here. And so that's a huge sort of storehouse of carbon that is released when you kill the above ground biomass. After a sweat soaked hour, we finally made it, or at least close enough to see the ocean. So this is it. I can see the water out there. Yeah, we're at the end. We're at the edge of the lagoon. And you can really see, I mean, if there's a storm out there, it has to get through this dense root system in order to get to land. Yeah, it's vitally important for protecting the coast. Now, Phil, are there any preliminary results of the research now? Yeah, the results are really starting to trickle in on these guys. And when you look at mangroves, you think water to them is just water. They're, they're immersed in it, but really it can vary. And what they found is climate change, and right now they're going through a drought, is drying up the land water, making it way too saline for these plants. So some of those mangroves are being affected. Yeah, these are highly adapted systems. They they survive in a particular range of salinity, you know, so if, if you deviate from that, you know, they potentially are in trouble. So when we're talking about the effect that climate change is having on ecosystems, you talk about vulnerability and you talk about value. And here, these mangroves, I mean, they're adding such value to the system, not just because of their root systems, but also because they can capture CO2 and kind of help combat this global destruction that we're seeing. The ecosystem services that they provide are really numerous. Now, guys, here is a stat that completely blows my mind. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Yeah, and I think when people hear that, they think warming, melting ice. But it's actually not melting ice. It's warming ground that we're worried about. Yeah, I went to Alaska to look at that ground because within it is permafrost, something that is supposed to stay permanently frozen. But when you warm it, it starts to melt, and there's a wide range of effects that happen. So let's take a look. Rising temperatures are changing the face of the Arctic, on the sea as summer sea ice recedes, and on land as Earth once permanently frozen thaws. That thaw is eroding parts of Alaska's northern coast, buckling its roads and causing trees and houses to tilt. It's pretty difficult to live in this kind of house. Vladimir Romanovsky has been studying this frozen ground called permafrost for 40 years. So what is permafrost? Any earth material which is at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more consecutive years, that's its permafrost. Rising temperatures aren't the only thing causing permafrost to melt. Deforestation, construction, even a bad wildfire season like the summer of 2015 can impact permafrost. To understand why things get lopsided when permafrost melts, you have to understand its structure. And there is no better place to do that than here, almost 50 feet below the ground in a one-of-a-kind research facility near Fairbanks, Alaska. It's a 360-foot tunnel dug out of Earth that's been frozen for tens of thousands of years. We see around 10 to 14, 15,000-year-old bones in the wall as they began excavating this. Quentin Gehring is a research engineer at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permafrost tunnel. They're just everywhere. These bones are giant. Absolutely. This 
Looks like a pelvic of a mammoth, still right around 14,000 years, carbon dated. The tunnel was created in the early 1960s to test excavation techniques in permafrost. After it was built, the core added this refrigeration system to keep the exposed permafrost from melting. Now it serves as a living lab for scientists who want to study the past and get a better handle on the future. Material types, ice content, moisture content, in terms of dating these ice wedges, understanding more of the development of these ice features, dating the organics and dating the carbon. Ice content is key to predicting what will happen if the permafrost melts. If the ground is mostly soil and rock, it can remain stable even if it gets above freezing. But if the permafrost has large wedges of ice like this, a thaw will cause the ground to sink as the ice turns to water. Because summers can be warm in Fairbanks, permafrost here is close to the thaw threshold. But rising air temperatures are putting permafrost in Alaska's Arctic zone at risk too. For the last 30 years, for example, permafrost on the North Slope increased by three, almost three degrees Celsius. So that's pretty major in permafrost terms. It's a major change, especially if you project these changes into the future. Very soon, we can actually uh, cross this zero degree Celsius threshold. Melting permafrost is a threat to more than just the Arctic. That's because it stores carbon, up to 1,600 gigatons. That's more than twice the amount already in the atmosphere. Is that something we should be concerned about? Definitely. This study, co-authored by Romanovsky, found that up to 15% of the carbon stored in permafrost could be released by 2100. So the Arctic is warming, the permafrost is thawing, and the carbon is getting released. Right. Is that going to then just thaw it even more? Yeah, because that's typical positive feedback. <laughs> it will affect climate. Warmer climate will thaw more permafrost. By another 20 years, 30 years, this feedback will really kick off, and then we, we can have much more effect of this thawing permafrost. Now, what's interesting about this episode to me is we've seen climate change affecting all different sorts of places, and whether it be in Alaska or Panama or right here in California, and it's not like we as techno go out looking for these climate change stories. We go places to cover one thing, and climate change is always part of the equation there. It's affecting everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, the U.S. is at the table for a lot of these global summits and global meetings on climate change, but unfortunately, at least to me, it seems like a lot of these are a lot of talk and not enough action. Yeah, I recently spent some time in Europe to see how they do it, and I'll tell you what, they are so active on this, and they have been, in some cases, for two decades working on fixing climate change in their country. On the international scale, we talk about carbon, carbon emissions being used as this type of international currency and exchange because other countries are really acknowledging that this is an issue that we need to solve. Now, whether we're in California or Panama or Alaska, everywhere we look, we're taking cues from nature and we're seeing climate change is happening, so we're gonna keep following it wherever it goes. That's it for this episode of Techno. We'll see you next time. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.